Hello everybody and welcome to Ghostly Truck Simulator. Thank you very much for joining me on what I guess is going to be a bit like a ghost train, but uh, but you're in a truck with me. We are driving, check my notes, from Bremen to Hanover in uh, northern Germany. Uh, we're in a um, Mercedes, uh, it says here, a Mercedes airbag model truck. Uh, we're transporting 11 tons of tractors. Should take us about three hours. I've uh, waited until the street lamps have come on. A ghostly time of night. Look, there's our nice two tractors. Let's hope they're still on the back of the cab by the time we leave this place. Um, so I wanted to do something. Oh god, this thing handles like crap. Sorry, I've not. Um, this is a rental. I've not driven this one before. I wanted to do something a bit different for uh, Cool Ghosts uh, coverage of Euro Truck Simulator, which is a kind of cool. A uh, very meditative game. Didn't just want to review it though, or do an ordinary let's play. I uh, wanted to do something fitting for how meditative and, and weird Euro Truck Simulator is. Let me just check. Yep, yeah, I'm not crashing into a wall. And I thought, well, what would I like to do if you were right here in that passenger seat with me? If we were on a road trip from uh, Bremen to Hanover transporting tractors? And I thought about ghost stories. Now, I love ghost stories, even though I don't actually believe in ghosts. Here, let me pop the indicator on. Yeah, stony pro. Uh, let's just hurry so a car doesn't crash into me. Uh, oh god, wait, it's Europe. I'm on the wrong side of the road. That... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That was a bit spooky, and we haven't even gotten started yet. Um... Yeah, so I thought I'd tell you a ghost story. I thought I'd tell you my favourite ghost story. Let's stop at the red light, because this isn't bloody GTA. So some background on me. I don't actually believe in ghosts. I'm a logical man. I don't believe in ghosts. But I do love ghost stories, and I don't actually think not believing in ghosts has to ruin any of the fun in ghost stories. And I've realised I have absolutely no idea which is the fast and slow lane in mainland Europe. But I'm going to stick to the left and see about if cars start piling up behind me or are overtaking me. Um, so let's start with a story about how much I don't believe in ghosts. If you've ever been to Edinburgh and done some of the tourist stuff, you'll know that... Uh, no, I'm just imagining you're sat right there and you're with me. This is so cosy. I should, I should play Euro Truck Simulator this way all the time. If you've ever been to Edinburgh, you'll know that it used to be a walled city uh, when uh, that was important. And because it was walled, they didn't want to build outside the city walls. So it was a city that kind of built upwards uh, rather than laterally. And it built over itself. It has all these things called closes, which are like streets that are below uh, the city and were ultimately sort of walled up and covered up. And there are... Okay, yeah, I'm in the wrong lane. Okay. Um, they were eventually covered up. I should put my lights on as well. Oh, what button's that? No, that's the windscreen wipers. Piss. Okay, there we go. Um, oh god. So, I went into something called Mary King's Close, and it's named after a, a lady known as Mary King, who, no, wrong lane, oh god, uh, who was a girl who, due to old historical documents we know, was alive and died from plague. And you do a big ghost tour of the closes, which are amazing, and these awful, sort of old, bricky, uh, they're the closest thing to an actual dungeon you will ever find in real life. And at the very end of the tour, they save the best till last. You go into this ridiculously well-lit room, but before that, they stop you. And they say, now, people feel a little funny in this room. We believe it's haunted by the ghost of, of Mary King, who was a young girl who died of plague. Some people feel a bit funny in here, but and some people leave her gifts. But let's just go in, so don't be afraid to let me know if you feel a bit weird. So we all went into this room, and there was a huge altar covered, and I mean covered in... Uh, Where's my cruise control? There we go. Uh, covered in stuffed toys and stuffed animals. And uh, and I started feeling funny. In fact, I got so lightheaded in a way that I haven't done since I was a kid. And uh, it was bizarre. But because I don't believe in ghosts so much, and I knew this was just some weird coincidence, I didn't say anything. And I came so close to fainting, I felt so strange, that uh, I leaned against a wall... And was just praying that we would leave. That come on, come on, just let's just wrap up the tour so I can leave, and I don't have to admit to everyone that I feel weird and play into your sham. Um, and then you know what the tour guide said? The tour guide said, "We're just going to stay here for a moment and have a minute of silence." And I'm thinking to myself, "No, I can't stay in here. I'm going to faint." But I didn't faint. Uh, I almost did, and then we all filed out, 
and everyone was none the wiser that I felt weird. So I do believe that that's not just a coincidence. I mean, I, my brain could have played into the... Uh, Oh god, which lane is the right lane? My, I believe that maybe there's some kind of magnetic field in there that makes people feel odd, some natural phenomenon. Maybe I just, you know, got really nervous due to all the preamble the tour guide put in there. No, I may, oh god, am I in the wrong lane? Um, so yes, I, I do not believe that ghosts exist. But nonetheless, uh, I've got a great ghost story for you. This is a true story, and it should scare you whether you believe in ghosts or not. And it's to do with one Paul Dean, who's the guy who I founded Shut Up and Sit Down with, a um, very good friend of mine and a great games writer. He told me this story when we were driving to Ireland um, together as a part of a road trip, just like this. Um, and he used to live in a suburb of London called Yately. Now, Yately is uh, a shithole. He won't mind me saying that. He wanted to get out as soon as possible. My introduction to Yately was driving Paul home one evening and uh, and after I dropped him off, it was about 3 a.m. and I was driving home and there was a roundabout to leave Yately and get back on the motorway. And uh, what happened was some people pulled next to me in this shrill two-cylinder moped. <laughs> pulled level to my car like they were like two hitmen, except instead of shooting me, one of them just held up his middle finger and then they just drove next to my car for as long as they could, flashing me the middle finger until I joined the motorway and they, they pulled off. So that's Yately. Um, but this story relates to Millie Dowler, and it won't linger on Millie Dowler. This is a murder case in, in London, uh, not in London, so outside of London, happened in 2002. It's a tremendously sad story. Millie Dowler was a 13-year-old uh, schoolgirl who was abducted. Um, there was a nationwide search. The Sun newspaper offered £100,000 for information on where she was, uh, reward money that was never never claimed. Um so she disappeared in March of 2003, and her body was found in September 2003 in Yately, which is the suburb where Paul lives. It was found in a forest by some people who were mushroom picking uh, in an advanced state of decomposition and uh, declothed. Oh God, no, re ooh, no, no left turn, but that's okay because I'm doing a right turn. Um, now. Uh, it's not really like in the movies when the police find a body, and it's not like immediately the red tape goes up and the forensics guys show up. Um, the forensics guys aren't always necessarily around, especially when the body is found in the evening, as this was, you know. There's no sense pulling in an expensive team who are then going to poke around in pitch dark in the middle of a forest when, uh, you know, it's hard to even get all the equipment out there, because this was really in the middle of nowhere in a forest in Yately. And... Um, and so you wait. You have to assign police officers to wait with the body until the next morning when the forensics guys can show up. And again, of course, police understaffed. You leave one person to wait with the body, and you do this in shifts. And uh, a friend of Paul was doing police work experience at the time, and he was in the back of a car, a police car, you know, and if you've done work experience, you'll know the kind of awful drudge work this, this is. It's... Uh, uh, it's just the worst you know you, you don't know what to do you're a hassle to everybody you're surrounded by cops and this guy comes on the police radio uh, this guy who's with the body of Millie Dowler um, the guy doing work experience isn't anywhere near him but overhears this because police radios aren't just linked to um, to you or like or to your unit or to your colleagues they're, they're sort of they broadcast over the entire area and the person uh, must have known this um, when he came on the radio and so the police officer who I'll reiterate was guarding the body of Millie Dowler at about 2 or 3 in the morning completely alone with a corpse of a 13 year old girl comes on the radio and he announces to everybody uh, this is officer such and such I'd like to be relieved and so the dispatcher says you know can you explain no, I don't understand in police talk and uh, the guy says, I'd like to be relieved because um, because I can hear a girl asking me for help. And this is in the middle of nowhere. There is no girl. There is nobody. There is just this man and the corpse of a 13-year-old girl. And I cannot state how 
scared this man must have been to announce that over the radio, because whatever job you do... Oh, am I in the right lane? Oh, bollocks. No, I'm not. Let's go over the grass. Oh, God. Don't do this at home, kids. Ah. Um... I mean, in any job, it's important to be able to express that you can do your job. And in a job with so much machismo as the police force, you know, it's like the army. You can't admit that you, you're you hearing voices. And you know what the worst part is? Even after this guy was so scared that he came on the radio and announced, I can hear a girl ask for help, I need to be relieved, I'm unfit for duty. I'll reiterate, it's in the middle of nowhere. He had to keep waiting there in pitch darkness with nothing but, I guess, some torches with a corpse to be relieved. And I love that story because it's still horrifying even if you don't believe in ghosts because even if we assume that ghosts aren't real, I'm sure that police officer would have said that prior to that event he didn't believe in ghosts, but he was so nervous and the circumstances were so terrifying that some part of his brain started firing, started telling him he was hearing things and he got more scared and the brain kept telling him he was hearing more things and that can happen to anybody, that can happen to people who don't believe in ghosts, I mean our brains aren't mathematical thinking machines, they're, they're awful bundles of instincts and, and nerves and, and we don't even understand, we still to this day don't even know why humans dream I mean Think about how common it is for humans to be afraid of, uh, you know, uh, snakes and uh, and spiders. And it's almost certainly because when we were evolving over however many hundreds of thousands or millions of years, it was the humans that were afraid of these potentially poisonous animals in Africa that would survive longer. And our brains are just confluences of all this ridiculous stuff. All these insane instincts that corpses are bad, darkness is bad, and that can manifest itself in bizarre ways. The monarch butterfly, at the risk of sounding like a mp3 player you find in The Witness, the monarch butterfly performs a migration from Mexico to Canada every year, um, or certainly from Mexico to, to northern uh, United States and Canada. Um, and they noticed that in this migration it was doing this weird kink. It was They were flying not as the crow or butterfly flies, but they were flying to the left or right. And uh, it was geologists who cracked why this was. It was geologists who said, ah, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, there used to be a mountain there. And the monarch butterflies still have this instinct to fly around it because there's a mountain there, even though there's not. That's what brains are. That, oh god, damaged the, something, oh god, that's lost me 400 euros. My point is that our brains are terrible. There is a theory called epiphenomenalism, which is that this idea, the, the sense that we're making decisions, the, this idea that if you pick up a cup, you chose to pick up a cup, is nothing more than surface froth to prevent us going mad. Because if we knew that we didn't have control over our actions, we would lose it. And similarly, you know, you can see ghosts. Your brain might tell you you know, that that thing over there is some awful, horrible monster, some bizarre, unknowable creature that you should get the fuck away from. Even if you don't believe in that. Because your brain's not on your side, it just wants to keep you alive and it will do whatever weird stuff it takes to do that. So really, this story of the police officer and Millie Dowler, I like it because it tells us even if you don't believe in ghosts, even if ghosts don't exist, they're still out there. And one day you might just see one. And really, isn't that the same as if they existed? Oh, okay, is that... No, that... Oh, God. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video from Cool Ghosts, did you know that Cool Ghosts is entirely supported by, by cool patrons and... Oh god, if you've got a ghost story... Wait, hang on, no, I didn't finish the other thing. If you, um... Hang on, fuck. Uh, there's a... Fuck. Uh, fuck. Uh, wait, forward. Um, if you want to support the kind of work we do, you can do that on, on coolghost.net slash Patreon. And if you like this story, or this, this, this series, and want to... Fuck! Um, then you can put a... Fuck! 
uh, you can uh, make a you can email me uh, with a ghost story uh, at uh, Quentin Smith Stir Q U I N T I N S M uh, T S Smith S T E R at gmail.com. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs>